Good morning and welcome to a morning practice. I'm Simon Greer and that's Tom Scott, uh, co-founder of the Nantucket Project. And we're joined today by Liz Murray. Liz, we're so happy to have you. Uh, Liz, Thank you for having me. Great Hi. to have you here. Um, Liz uh, wrote a book called Breaking Night. It's a memoir about her own journey from homeless to Harvard. Uh, she's an inspiring speaker. I got to hear her at TMP9 and actually be in a couple of small group conversations with her. And each time she spoke, I was like, oh, wait, I want to follow up with her. So um, thank you for joining us today and making time for this conversation. It's great to talk to you. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Yep. Hi, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lars. Yeah, good to be here. It's that you guys are a breath of fresh air in in my quarantine captivity that everyone else is experiencing. It's it's nice to see adult faces also. I've been running around with my beautiful children, but it's great to talk to you. Yeah, it's it's a breath of fresh air. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Well, hope hopefully the show is is just that, a breath of fresh air. I think that's exactly right. Um so I just want to start off with uh uh, like a gratitude practice, a bit of a sense of like, what are we each grateful for uh, today and these days? And it could be a big thing or a small thing, but maybe we'll just, we'll kick it over to you first, Liz, just to share anything you might be feeling grateful for this morning. Yeah, I, there's a few things I tend to focus on every day. And the latest thing that came into focus, actually just before I stepped into this room, I was with my children. I'm grateful for my children. And I, you know, I suffered a lot of loss in my life, and when they came into the world, I felt then, as I continue to feel today, that they are a walking, breathing, living miracle. You know, mm-hmm. and so I'm, I'm grateful for my children and my family, and my husband today. Great, thanks, thanks, Liz. Tom. Yeah, I would say. Um, yeah, I was having a conversation earlier today with um, a friend of mine, and we were talking about a sense of frustration that you want to be able to help the hospital workers and it's hard to help the hospital workers. In fact, they tell you to stay away. So, which I understand. Um, And then I, you know, we were having a conversation like who are the kinds of people who you think would have that spirit? And I started naming people. Well, I work with them. They're the people I work with. I mean, the the, the people I work with are those kinds of people. Um, And I'm, I'm, you know, I feel very fortunate to work with those kinds of people. Thanks. Thank you both. I I, uh, I wrote down my my gratitudes in my journal and um, feel like I keep coming back to the same themes about being healthy and my family being healthy. But the thing, and this is so minor in a way, but today I was making toast with butter and jam for my son, uh, who's you know doing his distance learning, and I was just thinking this could be a burdensome, like oh I have work to do and now I'm making toast. But instead it was like oh right I get to like make toast for my son and he's sitting right there and I hear him chatting away with his school friends. And I just thought there's something sweet and beautiful to be, to be grateful for, to get to be there with him and provide that for him and see how happy it makes him to have his toast and how normal it feels to him that we're having toast for breakfast in the morning. Cause that's what we do. So I was feeling grateful mm-hmm. for that. Liz, you look mm-hmm. like you might want to jump in on that. Was there something else you wanted to say? Yeah. It's, um, you know, I was thinking about listening. To, my children were, so I never get to hear my kids in class because they're seven and eight. They go to school, they come home. And I don't know about anyone who has kids, but you ever ask, how was your day? And you get like, good, you know, <laughs> one word answer. And I was, you made me smile a little bit, the image of you giving toast to your son while he's doing distance learning. Because I was thinking, it reminded me, you know, that's right. I heard my kids today and I could hear as they spoke to their classmates online, you know, their personalities socially and getting a little tiny taste of who they are out in the world. Mm-hmm. And I stood in my kitchen this morning as I was preparing a meal for them. And I listened to that and I stopped the way someone might stop to listen to birds singing, you know, and I just listened and you know, I know they're real people, <laughs> but sometimes, you know, you get to hear their humanity and in a different way. And, and it's something I wouldn't have had access to. And I, you know, I just cherished it. That's all. Mm-hmm. Thanks. 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 Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's just sit quietly. We'll go to our three minute meditation and uh, we'll continue the conversation after. We're going to start with a brief sound meditation. So just soften your gaze. You can even look down towards the floor. Notice your breath for a moment anywhere 
in your body where it's easy for you to notice it. So that could be at the base of the nostrils. It can be gently moving in your chest. You might even feel the breath moving all the way down into your low belly. Allow your attention to float from sound to sound. And all together, I'm going to invite, invite in a long breath through the nose for four counts. So breathing in, two, three, four. Exhale through the mouth. Good. One more like that. Breathing in again, two, three, four. And exhale through the mouth. This time, we're going to exhale with a long extended ah. Uh, just on one tone. So your tone might not match mine. So breathing in nice and full. I don't always ask this, but did anything come up for either of you while you were sitting there peacefully that's that's worth sharing? I can say something for me, which is that I, I meditate, you know, several times a day. This is the best one I do every day. Something about, well, I, I guess we're together. Um, and I was, it came through me. I was like, wow, these are always the, int the intense ones I do. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, Liz? Yeah, so over the last several years, as I've looked to step more into mindfulness practices in my life, which run counter to my New York City culture, you know, where you go and go and everything's quite caffeinated. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it didn't come naturally to me initially, but what I find is when I do sit in quiet meditation, as I was just a moment ago, the slow me down and uh, images sometimes come to mind. And I used to think about, you know, kind of swatting those away, but now I realize they're rich with information. Mm -hmm. And as, as I closed my eyes a moment ago, an image came to mind of a car crash. And I think my, my mind is working off of uh, metaphors with lessons in them. And I was just sitting with what the lesson was and what, you know, this came to mind this quick, but takes longer to explain. Um, you know, I, I had an image of driving to an important destination and loading the car up with all the, you know, the goodies you want for a long ride. You know, what music you'll have, what, um, you know, the, keep the kids busy in the back with something. You know, you load, you load your car up with your, your stuff. And then the car crashes, you careen down the side, and there's a moment where you can't reconcile. 
Like what happened to you? <laughs> and I think going with that metaphor, um, you know, things fall apart. Things fall apart in life. And sometimes when you're hit with loss, you know, I was thinking of the moment where you look at everything that you had in the car and you think to carry it all out of here. How can I get out of this ditch? And then you realize you can only take what is most essential and you have to cut, the, cut your losses and like, you know, this is what happened. And now I have to get out of here. So I had this image of what would I truly take with me? My children, maybe the first aid kit, you know, I think I would leave the iPad. I think I would, you know, and that sense of what happens when catastrophic loss uh, hits us and how it cuts away the fat. So my, my brain, my heart, my mind, my spirit was giving me this image of you know, taking only the most essential things. So I think that's what was going on for me, that sense of accepting what happened, cutting loss, grabbing that which is most essential and being reminded of what matters. Yeah, I, as you were talking, I was struck by the, um, this moment uh, is often a helping in some ironic way with us sorting for what are the essentials. Yeah. So it feels like there's a crystallization of like, well, that's an essential. Well, that, that would have been nice to have, but this one's an essential. Um, right. Right. And it stains you, actually, right? Because mm -hmm. when we look more deeply, you know, and, and let's talk about the use of the word essential in the media right now, right? And who's essential and whose work is essential. And it's not to, you know, say anything else isn't important. There's things that sustain life and things that stimulate life, and they both have their role, and they both are of great value. But when we think about essential, especially in the context of mindfulness, and gratitude, it might be worth our time to pause and consider in all the, the plenty that we've had, what is it that actually allows us as pillars to sustain, right? And, and that you get right to it right away. I, I packed, you know, cans of tuna fish. <laughs> I packed all this stuff. I wasn't sure it's gonna happen to the supply chain. I grabbed my family, I went and we have, I'm grateful to have shelter and food. Um, but it's, it's just a moment of reflection to see what allows us to be here to begin with. Liz, I just want to ask, how much is your description of how you responded to the car crash metaphor and the way you've planned for uh, taking care of your family in this moment, how much is that shaped by your own childhood and your own journey? I mean, it's tremendous, right? So I, I grew up, well, it's funny enough, before I had you know, so I was, I grew up in the Bronx. I had my parents who were deeply loving and profoundly addicted to serious narcotics. And I lost them eventually to HIV, AIDS, you know, addiction, just the whole, the whole lot. But there was this, you know, there's a moment when you, well, when the floor falls out from under you. And in that, in my case, it was losing them and ending up homeless for some years in my adolescence. But prior to that, I just, we didn't have a lot anyway. Right? So so I did, it wasn't like I had a bunch and then I like lost it. We had each other and that's everything. But in terms of food and stuff, like I didn't grow up with that stuff. And I never really felt I needed it because we were okay mostly. And then from there I experienced loss. So I lost even then what was most essential. So it wasn't the difference between I didn't need my stuff. I only need my loved ones. I always knew I only need my loved ones and then I lost them. You know, and then I lost my home. So the 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 learning from that, uh, well, it's it will be lifelong. But I will definitely, to answer your question, is to say that every bit of my life experience informs the way that I am recalibrating every day now during this crisis that we're all experiencing, because I'm watching people have freakouts, um, who to me, and I like this is not like about judgment or anything. It's actually like I, I feel love when I see people scared about losing, um, you know, sort of the extras that they have in their lives. I have, you know, like I feel kinship and I relate. But at the same time, I almost want to say, you, you don't you're going to be fine without that. <laughs> Let's worry more if it gets down to your food and your shelter. These are really things that you do need to worry about. You're going to be OK without the extra house. You're going to be OK without the vacation to Lake Tahoe. Like you're going to be. And, and some of that is not to poo-poo that people are attached to materialistic things. It's sometimes they become part of our identity. So it's really about letting, what's actually probably happening is a conversation of am I enough and do I matter to other people if I don't have these things? Does it change my status? So it's really probably about in-group, out-group and belonging. So what I know from my loss 
is that you can live with a lot less than you think you really can. And, you know, and if you're lucky enough to have your health, a roof over your head, food, you'd be surprised, <laughs> you know, it gets really practical really quickly and you're, you're going to be okay. Right. So, so I do think my experience leads me to that. And then also I have a dear friend who is a poet who I love, uh, Travis Montez. And he says, gratitude is extremely simple that we overcomplicate it. Gratitude is just nothing more than realizing that every single thing you have, you could just as easily not have it. And there's a way to know that in your head, but then there's a way to know it as a marriage between your head and your heart. And loss does that. Pain does that. I'm grateful for my pain. I'm grateful for my suffering because it is through that, that I have a muscle memory now in my heart that when I had to leave New York city with my family, I lost all my paid work. Let's bring this into practical reality. I'm in the live events industry, my friends. I'm a speaker for a living. I have a nonprofit that I, you know, I'm going to have to start thinking about a salary and how to make that happen. Right. So like, so I'm about to go from Harvard to homeless right now, you know, like it's going to, this is a progression in three parts uh, or a regression. I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'm telling you, or you know what it was? Have you seen my favorite thing? Can I curse on this thing? And I, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. So I saw, you know, uh, this meme, uh, me, January 1st, 2020 is going to be my year. M you know, me, March 20th, <laughs> wipes ass with coffee filter, you know? <laughs> Just to be clear, like, I'm not trying to, like, I'm not calling you for my, if I open this door, the wall outside is not finished and there are wires hanging out of it. Um, <laughs> okay. Like, we can't afford the insulation to finish the wall outside this door, but, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm not, like, in some cozy, what have you, and I have, like, many cans of beans, but I'm, Look, I'm like, don't want to look at my ATM balance. I'm just trying to be clear that I'm not speaking, you know, conceptually, I'm speaking very practically. And yet at the same time, my children are also outside that door. So is my husband. I can breathe. You know what I thought about during that meditation? You know, I saw those people breathing. We could breathe. Right. So I think my tragedy and everything allows me to kind of say, um, it doesn't mean I'm not devastated because actually, yeah. You know, I cried a lot when I lost all my work. I'm scared. I don't know how I'm going to feed my family. I'm just going to tell you that. That's the truth. However, I have those moments. And what I know now through all my pain and loss is I allow myself to hurt. Fuck it. I'm sad. I think my favorite word is and. <laughs> you know, the actor's studio, they ask you your favorite word. Mine is and. <laughs> okay. Uh, because... I, I really don't like all the peppy self-help crap that's telling you to like, but be grateful, but fuck that. You know, I'm sorry. I'm upset about what's going on, but I'm not sorry. And that's okay. And, and I'm like also super grateful and I'm having all these moments with my family. I never would have had, and both are happening at the same time and the good and the bad happen side by side. And that's what I learned through my experience. And I, don't you guys think? I mean, wouldn't you say that that's true right now for you? I mean, it's all mixed together, no? Yeah. This is this is what I believe. So it's not one or the other. It's all true at the same time. Tom, I feel like Liz hit on a number of themes you've hit on during the, the show in the last week. I don't know. Before we go to, to journaling and reflecting a little, is there anything you want to add? I think that um, I identified with a lot of that. I mean, Simon, you've heard me say it before. The best thing that ever happened to me is the worst thing that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm all over the end. I'm all over the fear. I too am in the live event business. You know, it's like, I get it. I've heard a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot of money moving around our world right now. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to be fine on my physical well being. Well, my material well being. I mean, I, I hope I don't get sick. Um, but, you know, it doesn't mean there's not a lot of pain going on. I mean, I have been really, I am really tired. Like I, I've, I've gotten very little sleep in the last three weeks because I'm, I got a lot of responsibilities on my hands and it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And I'm seeing ugly things. I'm seeing beautiful things all at the same time. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like uh, you both hit, you know, fear, and pain are fertile ground for love and for hate. I mean, people can turn fear and pain into the rage and the 
division. It can also be a place from which we come together and shared experience and compassion. And so uh, there are a lot of choices we each make and will make as a country uh, and as a planet in response to, to this moment. So um, let me ask you to pull out your journals. Um, I don't know, Liz, if you have a journal handy or piece of paper, Tom, I know you've got yours and we'll just, I'll time two minutes and we'll, we'll yeah. just turn off. Okay, you can finish up your sentence, finish up what you're writing. Uh, Liz, maybe we'll go to you first, then anything you jotted down that you wanna share? Yeah, more of a, something of a list that just kind of came up. Maybe it's because of what we were just talking about, but I had, you know, the, in a sense, these polarizing experiences, right? So the sense of being caught between, so the sense of gratitude, and also the sense of devastation, the uh, sense of I want to be in the present moment with my family. I'm also worried about the future. Um, there's the economy and, and what's in the free fall, but there's also the value of human life and these things that seem to pull at opposites. So I, I have a list of those. And then I wrote about the, what it means to be in the vacillation between tension. We often call these things divides, but I've been thinking, I've been calling into question that word a lot, and I, I've really been thinking more deeply, is it a divide or are we vacillating between forces that pull us in opposite directions? And when they do, they draw out of us attention and the tension calls us to, to create meaning. And, right, and that in a sense, I wrote maybe instead we are dancing, you know, and there's something about dancing and learning who we are inside of the dance uh, that feeds one another. And I was writing about, that beautiful dance and that vacillation. And then I ran out of time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like the dancing. I appreciate that. Tom, anything? I wrote about almost the same thing. I mean, I didn't <laughs> use the word dancing, but I, I was writing about, um, you know, I was with a guy who I like. I liked the guy and I was asking him, he's sort of like a, uh, he's a future focused guy. And uh, I asked him why he's so into what he does. and. He said, because I like new things. And I think I like new things too, but I also think new things are like a form of addiction. Mm. Like you just got to keep looking and looking and what does that even mean? Like, what do you need that new thing for? Talking about thoughts and ideas, not physical things. But, um, and then I, I'm sure I have that in me, which is just like a consumerist, uh, now isn't good enough type thing. I'm sh I know that's in me. Um, but there's this other thing too, where it's like, a, you know, it's 
it's like a seeking it sounds corny but it's a it's just a it's wonder you know and it's there's humility in it i mean just because of the size of it and i you know and i was writing about the fact that even now we're doing that dance you know not we're doing it right now and i'm writing about it right now and i do this kind of throughout my day um anyway and i threw some gratitude into all of that but that's what i was writing about it's just i, I go into these uh interactive experiences that by the way i think is as it's as important that it's about you know i i there's plenty I, I don't like about myself you know i, I don't want to be the kind of person who hates himself all the time but i have been that kind of person but there are certainly things I look on and I think of the mistakes that I've made, you know, there's plenty of those. Um, and, you know, I like it when somebody gives me like their grace, which I would just think of as like their unwarranted love. And, and I think that's a big part of it is that you can just give that to people sometimes. And, you know, that is like the threshold of wonder when you're in that place, because, you're actually in a place of both giving and not knowing, which is different than knowing and taking. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't, it's hard to do that alone. It's hard to do that alone. Can I, I, I want to hear your, can I just ask you a one thing about that? Yeah. <laughs> can you say more about un unwarranted love? Well, I just think of gratitude or, or grace, I should say. Grace is just, you know, forgiveness when you don't deserve it. And it's like an, it's like an unconditional love. Um, and, you know, I think that's sort of the nature of man, or it's certainly the nature of a guy who was raised in the Catholic church, who went to Catholic school, who we, we were clearly told that there's a ledger and you're, you know, where, where are you on the ledger? And, um, you know, when, when, if, if, if the day comes when you can think of the world, humanity, or your God as a loving thing, that grace is ridiculously powerful, ridiculously freeing. I mean, when Nadia talks about you know, the mix of the center saint, it's like that is so freeing to certain people. Thank you for, for clarifying. That's actually quite um, beautiful. <laughs> quite was, beautiful kind of grace. It was, it was really something to both of you, and this is, I was writing about Liz because it happened before we journaled, but I saw it with you, Tom. I, uh, you know, and it, we're not in person. And so obviously a lot is lost, but there's a moment where both of you went into like making it real, which was maybe about words, but it was about your body and your tone. Like I could see just on the screen, you know, the, a shift in your energy. Um, uh, it was like, Liz, when you first said like, is it okay to curse? In a way, Tom said yes. And it was permission not just to curse, but to be real, right? Like I think the curse brought with it, like uh, this is what's really on my mind. And so I, I was writing about, like I wrote, I appreciate Liz making it real um, and removing pretense. And I was then speculating about uh, how real to make it with my kids. Like wow. what do I tell them is real right now? Like they wanna know when we're gonna go home, but I don't know. And so I don't lie to them but I don't want them to just like be panicked that they may never go home. So I'm reassuring that we will go home. You know, right. I, I don't know for sure, but I assume we will. I tell them we're together and we will be together through this. And I believe that's true. So I feel comfortable saying that. And um, I, I say we're still healthy. I don't promise everybody we know will stay healthy, but I, I know they need to know that their parents are healthy and will be with them, right? Not afraid of losing us. That's, and so I think because of your own story, Liz, and then how real you made it, my head went in the journal to how real, good parents, how real should we make this for our kids and how do we manage that for them? So that was, that's, that's where, where my heart kind of moved me to. I, that, can I say something to you about that? I mean, that's really, that's huge for anyone with children right now, right? Because there's this sense of abandon and I love that unwarranted love. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep that, I wrote it down. Um, and, and what that is between adults is so distinct when you're responsible for children, this is an entirely different experience, right? Children 
look at the adults responsible for them, you know, the way we look at flight attendants during turbulence, you know, if you're okay, I'm okay. If you're okay, I'm okay. You know, and, and they, they, they correct and write themselves uh, by the energy, the space we create. And I, I certainly, I just wanted to relate to you that, you know, like I, I don't know the answer, but I do know that I can't change how uncertain things are in the world, but I can hold a space for them. Mm-hmm. Here's what you can count on. And here's what, we can't and you know i'm gonna love you forever um you know but will you die of this virus i don't think so honey things happen but love is forever i let them know it's forever um you know i remind them what we have that you're not gonna i will make sure you don't run out of food i'll make sure that this doesn't happen here are some other adults who love you let's count all the adults who love you let's count the community around you look how loved you are look how surrounded and yes it's true that i don't know what will happen here here and here and here you know, and, and I'm doing my best, but I, I want to re- relate to you because how that is a tricky thing. You know, this morning I had, I, I was on the show with RP Eddy and I was on with a guy named Clint Watts. And these guys are two like very senior level government types, big time. And we were talking about a lot of things, including counterintelligence in a time of Corona. And it's, it's intense what's going on with like, this is a really good fertile ground for counterintelligence and Russians and Chinese are loving just pulling our culture apart through the use of social media to divide us. Like that's how this works and they do it really well. Anyway, that's the conversation we're having. That's the kind of conversation we're having. And and when we were going into the show, you know, now and again, ideally fairly often, I ask myself the question, what is my job here? What, what is my function in the world? Not how do I buy low and sell high today? I just think it's so important to ask myself that question a lot. So going into the show, I asked myself that question and I thought, you know what? This is good information and not valuable information. And I firmly believe that. But we can also make this information for those people on the front lines. And I said it, I got on the show with like two serious dudes who are way smarter than me, very smart guys. And I said, you know, I want you to think about the people on the front lines, the men and women in the hospitals around the country who are doing the work as we do this. And then it ended. And then I went into this, like, am I just the goofiest loser of all time? Like, why did I just say that? I mean, that's how I felt. I felt, and, and what, I, what I know is, and by the way, I've gone on the journey since that was like two hours ago or three hours ago. And I'm like, was I an idiot? Do I sound like a fool? And then I'm like, no. And as we were talking, I was like, you gotta do that. You can mm. do that. You're allowed to do that. that that's actually, there is a perspective on counterintelligence that relates to people sacrificing on the, it, it's real. Anyway, I, I was able to sort of think through that. Now I will be insecure about it again in 20 minutes and then I'll feel better about it again in two hours just because that's how my soul works. So Tom, you just helped me tremendously, just so you know. I don't know if anyone else can relate and I always wonder whoever ends up watching this, I think about you while we're, while we're doing this. Um, but I'll say I can relate. When you just did that, Hey, sometimes I think I'm the only one who's um, who suffers from that kind of what do they call it a vulnerability hangover? You know, where you're, you're like, I think I'm going to take a risk right now, and I know who I am, and I'm going to say the thing, and then it just falls flat, or you're not sure if that worked, and I that's almost like a meal that I'll snack on for three days later, right. you know, and then it'll steal my confidence in the middle of a future unrelated meeting two years later, you know, and <laughs> it just comes up, and it's really you know, you're, you're powerful in the world who you are and you walk in rooms with big names. You are big in, in the space you walk in as well. You're a man, you're a white man. You've had financial success for you to say that. I just wanted to, you know, like, thank you because it's different hearing it from you. (laughs) And I know maybe you don't look like that to yourself, but I can tell you from the outside looking in, like, I don't, I don't get that from folks who walk like you talk, like you look like you and it's freeing. So I, you know, it liberates me and I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you both. You know, I, I, I'm struck by how that feeling, like I've said this to you, I think on stage at TNP Tom, like I feel like I know I'm doing good work in the world because I'm always anxious afterwards that like I did it wrong. I'm not good enough. I'm unworthy. I failed. Like when I don't feel that I know work has kind of become rote right? Like I'm not challenging myself because I'm just sure I got it. And so what I know about in myself that desperate insecurity of like, 
I'm not enough, but that feeling that only shining the light on it like softens it, right? When I try to tuck it away and pretend that I'm good, like I'm sure I'm good, it, yeah. it eats away at me more. And when I can say it, and it's the power of you saying it and Liz, you responding like in front of other people, I think that lets people be like, all right, it's okay to say, I don't know, I'm not totally sure. I'm, I'm afraid I blew that one. And that I, I, to screw up. Yeah. Right, and I survived, I survived, I'm okay. I'm actually gonna be stronger for it, not diminished for it. So anyway, I, I really appreciate both of you making it real and, and having this conversation this morning. Any, any last words, Liz or Tom, before uh, we Yeah, I, yeah as, a, as a maybe something to transition into finishing, I wanna pick up on a word you just said. You were saying stronger for it. And the floor fell out from under all of us collectively right now. And I tend to subscribe to the belief that when things break and when they fall apart, uh, as painful as they are, if you look closely at them, the basis of, of whatever the, the break was is so rich with information about how to improve going forward or to say it in the most concise way that we can be strongest in, in the broken places. And so what is going on right now, when you say stronger for it, I wanna bring it forward into now. And I wanna think about, obviously a virus isn't, you know, <laughs> no one caused that virus. It's not, doesn't have volition. There's no one to blame for that virus, the existence of it. However, I'm sure I'm like everyone else looking up you know, academics giving lectures about, you know, uh, coronavirus and infrastructure for health. What is happening now, in a sense, has come, uh, has caused confrontation of the systems we have in place, of what we put as more valuable over something else, you know, where we don't understand our interconnectedness. How really, I saw someone say that quarantining some states and not others is like making a peeing section in the public pool, you know, like, it's like all mixed in. I'm sorry to be gross, but like, there's not, not a separation. We are all in a sense, this is, this is showing us that the planet is like, we're a living, breathing organism. And to the extent that we don't understand our interdependence and our interconnectedness, we've ignored setting up structures that fosters optimal health for everyone. We've ignored the, the idea that when we all do better, we all do better, right? And then this comes raining down on us disproportionately. I want to think that maybe we'll see, because again, it's that vacillation in the dance and what you take out of it with you going forward. Will we maybe look more closely after this and say, can, can, what are the lessons learned? How can we make sure that we have more security for the most vulnerable in our economy, in our health systems and our structures so that when we get hit by something in the future, it doesn't take us to our knees. Uh, this reveals to us our interconnectedness. So if we're careful about it, I want to offer that the depth of the devastation can become the depth of the opportunity in certain ways. If you live to tell the tale after this, right? For our society, I wonder if we can be stronger in the broken places around the things that are cracking and crumbling now as a society, systemically, structurally. I hope so. Thanks. You know, let, let me add one part to that, which is interrelated thought. Um, we are so capable of caring for and, and feeding each of us. I'm just going to say in our country. Uh, it, broadly, it's harder for sure, but I'm just going to say in our country. And I'm so hopeful that we, all of us, are able to communicate because that's the only challenge. We just got to communicate who needs it, where to find it, how to get it there. But I feel so strongly that we will rally and make sure that that part of this can be dealt with if we communicate. And so I'm just really hopeful that we are able to communicate over the next couple of months to deliver on that because I just, and I don't know anything about it. I mean, I've been doing shows about it and talking to people about it and I know about it very generally. I I I'm just hopeful that specifically we're able to communicate and help people right now. I think um, maybe to wrap us up, you know, Liz, the spirit of we can be strongest in the broken places and Tom, the idea that we can rally. I, I want to believe those things. And I, and I would say about half the day I do. And sometimes I go to a much more like 
people are scared and and when they're scared people contract and so a lot of what um, the show has done for me and my my own practice has done for me is trying to honor both those things being real and then continue to pull myself back to the we can solve problems together we're interconnected we can be strongest in the broken places because i feel like that's a struggle in each of us and yeah. uh, we can support each other to draw that out um, and support each other in, in in making that become true as we go forward so can i take one last thread from our conversation try to yeah. tie it with that <laughs> i want to just bring it back to vulnerability because so often, you know, I've heard my friends who have been deep in addiction, for instance, they're like, I got sober when I admitted my desperation. Um, when my husband and I speak for, you know, we had a horrible betrayal at one point and we, but we didn't have fundamental things worked out in our relationship. It brought it to the surface. We're closer than we've ever been. Um, when, you know, when, when you're able to sort of take the drawers and empty them out and look at all the contents, you can put them back in their rightful place but the key is we have to admit that that vulnerability was there. If we don't understand what made us broken, you can't solve a problem you can't rightly define, right? You're gonna be hitting the hammer at the wrong place, right? It's not, that's not it. Uh, we have to understand our vulnerability individually and as a people. And that vulnerability is like the pain of that, of our economic systems, of our health systems, of our, it, and if you take that vulnerability and you take our interconnectedness and our interdependence, if we can look at those things boldly in, in the face, then that would give me hope <laughs> that we would then be able to say, you know, it's, it's time to, to recalibrate who we think we are and, and how we operate and how we treat one another. But it would require us to sit in our vulnerability and our interconnectedness. And I just want to, I can't let the conversation go without that because it won't be hubris. It won't be arrogance that fixes this. <laughs> it won't be sweeping it under the rug. It will be admitting who we are. And always the question is then willingness. Are we willing to look at that? Not as an admonishment, but as a, a map <laughs> for where we go from here. I love that. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Appreciate having you on the show this morning. Good Great to see you, Tom. Cool. Yep, we'll see you again. Wait, I'll see you sometime soon when your beards are long and your hair has grown out and we're <laughs> out of isolation. <laughs> Great to see you guys. Yep. Thank you for having Thanks, me. Liz. Great seeing you.